So again, um, welcome, and we're so glad that you are here. Thank you for giving up part of your afternoon. I promise I will do something that is very difficult for me, and that is keep the talking to a minimum so that you can go home early. <laughs> um, but we did think it was important to uh, do something a little bit different today with our webinar. We have had some big changes over the summer. Uh, if you haven't logged into EdgeSmart so far this year, I think you're really going to love what you see. We've made some really great improvements. And so we wanted to take some time and just walk you through uh, those changes that have occurred so you know what to expect when you log in and start using us for the year. But again, we will try really hard to keep it kind of short for you today since it is um, early in the school year and there's no teacher, there's no tired, like teacher tired at the beginning of the school year and the end of the school year. So um, we'll also be sure we are recording today's session and you will get a recording of the session uh, as we, um, in the next few days for follow-up. So to go ahead and get us started, we are going to be talking about all the, um, what's new with EdgeSmart. We're going to cover the content library and how that has changed our workspace tab and some new options that you have available to you there. Um, the reporting page where we have all of our student data um, and how we've kind of cleaned up and simplified that for you. And then there's been some very slight changes to our content and scoring. What's great here is what everything you know and love about EdgeSmart is still there. Like we have not gotten rid of anything, everything that you, like if you've created lessons or links or anything like that, it is still there for you. Nothing has changed as far as what you have access to. We've just cleaned up the actual interface, how you find information, and made it much more simple for you. So we're very excited about that. So with that all said, we're just gonna go ahead and jump into the platform. I'm gonna log in and notice on our home screen, um, we have updated the short getting started videos. So all of these uh, five videos, they're short. They're like three to four minutes each. As you begin working, especially if you're new to EdgeSmart, these will be very helpful for you. Otherwise, um, nothing is new on the home screen. It's all the same material, anything recent you were working on. The magic happens here in our content library. So um, when I navigate to a grade level, and I'm just going to click fifth grade, uh, it's kind of in between for all of the grade levels that we offer both here and in Florida. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're, you know, everyone is going to see the same change when they log in. However, um, I do want to point out that some of our Texas districts, because of the new standards that they have, you know, Everyone has to adopt new standards next year. Some grade levels have already adopted them for this year. So some people, when they log in, are going to see a couple of extra little tiles here that are for science and engineering practices and recurring themes and concepts. Everyone else will see the same um, content that you had available to you last year. So there are slight differences depending on your district options, but for the most part, it's going to follow the same pattern. So whichever uh, set of teaks you're working out of, you'll still see the same information. So my drop down for grade level occurs first, and then um, I have the option to toggle back and forth between English and Spanish. Of course, all content K through five is available in both English and Spanish. And then in the middle and upper grade levels, only the readers are available in Spanish. But I would still use the same toggle to get to the um, other language. From there, I have the option of either using the drop down to choose my reporting category, or I can simply click on the tile. In Texas, of course, matter and energy is usually the first one, first uh, standard that we address. In nature of science for Florida, it would be that it would kind of like look the same and have the same flow. Um, so I'm just gonna use this particular set of standards. I do wanna point out we've added a great new search feature so this is like a keyword search. If I want to find all of the um, content that relates to this particular keyword within my grade, my grade level that I'm already on, I just click search. 
and it's going to pull up each activity and piece of content related to that search. So I love the new keyword search. A lot of people have been asking for that for a while. Once I've chosen my reporting category or big idea, I would then click either the drop down or again, just click into the tile to get down to the actual standard. From here, you're going to see all the um, content that you have available to you. So in our prior interface, all of this stuff was still available. It's just you had to scroll a long, long way in order to find it. So um, it just makes it so much easier and clearer for you to be able to see exactly what you have available to you all on one screen. Florida teachers, you'll notice we have added some additional teacher resources for you. So under the teacher resources tab, you'll also see some implementation strategies, some ELP strategies, and just some additional help. Um, Texas teachers will start seeing those next year. So we still have lots of changes coming with the um, with the new standards as well. One of the great uh, updates that have happened with this uh, new interface is the ability to search by either resource type or 5e lesson model. So this is a toggle. I simply click over to 5e and then you'll see each of the, um, the tiles as it would relate to the 5e lesson model. Um, for Texas, you're going to notice there's only four out of the five E's for most of you. Uh, again, with the way the standards are changing, uh, most Texas grade levels are not going to be doing the new standard yet. So we chose to hold back on that engage piece and not include the anchoring phenomenon yet in order to not like confuse people with the, the, the differences in standards. Some of you may see that, some of you may not, but you'll notice all of the other um, E's are available. You can use either uh, like toggle, either filter for any of the resources. So I think in my in my brain, what I think of is like if I'm planning ahead and I'm looking at my unit and I'm going, okay, how am I going to teach this unit? I'm probably going to use the 5e e model for my planning because that way I'm making sure that I'm getting the entire lesson arc and working through the best practices for my students. If I'm in class and I'm like, wow, my kids are not getting this material, I need to take a step back and give them some additional practice, I'm going to use a resource type because I can really quickly find the exact kind of resource I'm looking for. Or if I'm like, okay, this is cool, we have like an extra five minutes in class, I'm going to pull out the resource type and find something that works for this moment in time, that just-in-time instruction for my kids. So there's a time to use both types of, of filtering. Um, for today, I'm just going to use the resource type because we're, we're mostly, um, again, the content itself hasn't changed just a whole lot. It's just how you find it and access it. So we're not going to be spending a lot of time on actual content today. There are some changes that I do want to go ahead and point out. One of those changes, um, if you're familiar with our Word Explorer, We've changed just a little bit how your students are supported as they work through the Word Explorer. So, of course, select a flashcard to learn more right about there. the science term. Once you complete the activity successfully, the flashcard will flip over and reveal the formal definition. So, of course, the Word Explorer is for grades three and up, and it takes the, the science word and builds the students understanding of the word before it ever gives them the definition. So we always start with that visual example or visual definition. And I'm just gonna use electrical conductor. I'm gonna click on the, the vocabulary word. Visual examples. One or more images are examples of the term. Select your answers. Select submit to check your answers. So in this case, it's asking me to, to choose all of the pictures that relate to an electrical conductor. So what we've changed here is if I get a partially correct answer. You can make a better selection of the options. Try again. Notice it keeps the little check mark on anything that I got partially correct. So we're just giving your students an extra layer of support. It's telling them, hey, part of this is right. This is what you got correct. And you still haven't quite got all of them. Um, and so then it's going to allow me that second chance. You can make a better selection of the options. Try again. 
Now, now I have my my lifeline that shows up, um, so I can see I'm still not quite there yet. I but we never want your students like reaching that level of frustration where they just click anything to go. So um, we give them that that immediate feedback with the show answers button. It highlights the ones that are all correct, and then they can move on to the next part. So we've just added that layer of support where they get immediate feedback with the check mark. In addition to that um, additional level of feedback with the Word Explorer, which I'm just going to give a little plug here. The Word Explorer is really one of my favorite activities, and I don't think it gets enough use. Um, for Texas, it has three of the six new item types on the Star 2.0. And we know statewide, on average, the students did not do well on the new Star item types. That gives them multi-part, multi-select, and drag and drop. Plus, they're getting vocabulary practice. Like, it is such a great value for the time that you invest into using that Word Explorer. So we highly recommend that one. And in addition to the Word Explorer, we now are doing um, what we call vocabulary cards. It's basically a printed version of the Word Explorer. So in this case, we have a picture, the, the word itself, a, a fact, and then the definition. And for those of you in Florida, I believe, I'm not sure this has been added to your library yet, but it's coming if it hasn't. So you will be seeing this very, very soon. So these are great for using in all sorts of different ways. I might print them out and laminate them and use them as like some kind of word sort or card sort in my classroom. I might have the kids do like an interactive word wall with them or maybe some kind of interactive journaling activity where we create like Freyer models or four squares or however you wanna use them, whatever you use um, card sorts for within your class and grade level. These are an example, uh, excellent example of them. You can even blow them up into poster size and have your um, like an anchor chart already built just with the words. And they align perfectly with the Word Explorer. So we love those vocabulary cards. I think that was a really great um, addition to our library. One, um, a couple of the other changes have to do with scoring. So we heard feedback that um, a lot of teachers didn't really like the star scoring that we did on our online activities. The student review and the interactivity both were based on one, two, or three stars as the students performed. We've changed that to a percentage score. So I'm gonna hop based in. On physical properties. In this experiment, we classify matter based on its ability to conduct thermal energy by using a cup of hot water at 99 degrees Celsius. Drag and drop a sample of matter in the cup of hot water and wait for 30 seconds. Observe the new temperature using the infrared thermometer provided. Calculate the rise in temperature, which is the final temperature, minus the initial temperature in the table. Then classify the material as a thermal conductor or insulator. Let's begin. Drag and drop a strip on the cup of hot water. So this is one of the interactivities for grade five. Um, on properties of matter. And in the interactivity, we're gonna give them immediate feedback on how they are scoring. So for instance, I'm gonna drop in the copper strip. Now drag and drop the infrared thermometer on the strip. I'm gonna drag the thermometer. Use the data to calculate and enter the rise in temperature. So now I just calculate the difference in temperature and click enter. That's I right. Immediately now, get based feedback. on your observation, is this a thermal conductor or insulator? So it just showed me that I got 10 points. Now I'm going to say this is an insulator. That isn't right. Oh. Copper is actually a good thermal conductor. And it showed me that I got zero points. Now, when I go through the entire activity, I'm going to show you what that scoring component looks like in the end. Sorry, I'm having to scroll here. I had that a little different order in my brain earlier. I'm sorry, one second. Uh, there we go. For the interactivity, it's going to show your percentage score, a uh, total percentage. The student review is the same way. It's gonna give me a percentage score, which is awesome because now you can take that directly into your gradebook. Like, hey, they scored an 83%, I can put that in the gradebook. 
Now remember with student reviews and interactivities, we consider that formative assessment. The students can redo these as many times as they want to in order to reach mastery. So they can redo it over and over again in order to reach 100 and they're getting additional review as they do that. So, um, so it's a great option for the students and it gives you additional feedback on how well they're performing. Overall, those are the biggest changes to the content library itself. I do want to point out some changes, like notice up here, this is where my playlist button has moved to. So for instance, if I want to add an instruction module to my playlist, I'm going to click on the playlist option at the bottom of the tab, and it's going to show me my playlist. Um, you still have the same option for whether you want to create the do the playlist as a live lesson or as an assignment. A live lesson is where you as the teacher are going to lead your students through the activity. So I would project this on my overhead or I would do this in a small group. There's no data being collected because it's not being done on an individual student basis. So for a live lesson, this is anything I wanna lead my kids through. For example, the driving questions in Florida would be a great uh, uh, opportunity for that. Any kind of activity I would probably want to do as a hands-on, um, I might add that to my playlist. In the, our lower grade levels, we might want to do our readers and read um, together whole group. So I can choose to add a reader. A reader also makes a really great engage piece, as does our interactivity. So we could do those together as a group. Regardless, um, the workflow through the like live lesson or assignment has not really changed. If I want to create a live lesson, I create live lesson. I need to make sure this information is correct. I'm going to choose physical properties of matter. I enter my uh, live lesson, like maybe this is my practice for matter. This may be unit one, week one, or I could even say like this is the particular date that I want to project and start this unit. I would then be able to craft my lesson. Like I want to use the reader as my engage piece, and then we're going to watch the instruction module, and then we're going to do a hands-on activity. Once I've created my lesson, I click save live lesson. I've created the lesson. It's sitting on my desk, ready to go to the students. And my desk in Edgesmart is my workspace. So now I'm going to click on workspace. And you'll notice some big changes here, too. These are very exciting changes for us. Um, all the information is still there. It's just been cleaned up and simplified. So there's a tab across the top for each of your lesson components. I just created that particular lesson as a live lesson. So here is my live lesson that I just made. From there, I would just, it's going to automatically begin that lesson. If I had created this as an assignment, an assignment means that it's going to be pushed out to the student's individual devices. They complete it individually and we collect data on it. So anything that you do as an assignment, the kids are getting on their own version of. Now, any activity can be done as an, a live lesson or as an assignment. So for instance, our instruction mods, that's the, you know, the direct teach component. It's really designed to be done whole group. But if I have a kid who's been absent, I'm going to assign it to them and they can watch it individually. So any of the activities can be done either way. It's just a matter of how do you want to use it in the classroom? Are you wanting to lead them through that or are you wanting to push it out to their individual device? When you create assignments, one thing that we've heard is it was difficult to see who you had assigned the content to, and we've corrected that. So notice underneath here, so I have all of my same options, assign, share, view, and more, which is like remove, duplicate, all of that good stuff. And now I also have this, um, this toggle that shows me who have I assigned this lesson to. So in this case, I have assigned this to all of my groups. And I can actually click on the group and see which student within that group that I have assigned it to. So it's very easy to be able to tell who has been given an assignment and who hasn't. All I do is click on this assign to button underneath. If it's not yet been assigned, it will simply say not yet assigned. So big improvement there. We love that. 
We love being able to easily see these are the students who have received it. I can then click into um, more information like on our reports page and it will tell me, you know, when I assigned the assigned it and everything. But this is just like a quick glance for you. So um, excited to see that change. I don't think, I think that's um, the only other thing that's really changed on the workspace is that the pre-built assignment tab is now located here. It used to be more like in the content library. Now it's under the pre-built assignments, both in Texas and in Florida. So we've labeled the little buttons for you, but otherwise um, it's easy to find those pre-built. These are always great for um, sub days, for makeup days. Like if a, a student's been out for a week with the flu, I can assign the entire standard that they missed to them very simply with one of our pre-built assignments. Um, I would just simply click assign and the workflow for assigning an, a, a, anything to the kids has not changed. You still have all the same options as far as either EdgeSmart platform, the URL or Google Classroom. So um, again, very excited about that change. One thing, that has not changed in our library is our workflow as far as assigning a summative assessment more than once. This is a question we get a lot, so I wanna go ahead and quickly address it. And I'm gonna go back to my, um, go back to this just very quickly. So our progress monitoring has changed a little bit. We haven't changed a lot of the um, actual reports, it's just a matter of how you access them. But again, we have them kind of broken into either formative or summative. Formative being very growth oriented. A student can choose to go in and redo any of these activities on their own without any input from the teacher. But if you wanna reassign a summative assessment, we don't want them to be able to do this on their own. We don't want them just to take a quiz as many times as they want until they memorize the answers. We want authentic data for them. So for quizzes, unit tests, reporting category tests, and the, the practice EOC or SSA or STAR tests, depending on where and what grade level you are located in, you have to create a duplicate of the quiz. What that looks like is very simple. I've assigned this quiz, or I've created a quiz, for instance, I give the kid the quiz to my class. I cast the class completely bombs on the test. So some reteach is needed. We give some additional practice. I go in and do a reteach. And now I want them to have the opportunity to take the quiz again. I would click here where I have my quiz and click more and click duplicate. All I have to do is give it a new name. That way it's not overriding the data from their first attempt. So this is already named second chance. So this is gonna be now our third chance quiz. We just really needed that extra help. I do have to select what folder I want it in. And you do wanna make sure that you're, you know, like keeping things organized. I put this in earth and space. I click yes, I wanna duplicate it. And now I have a third chance quiz. You can easily find it by using the folder. I put it in earth and space. And I have my third chance quiz. So it's very easy to duplicate a quiz. You just need to be aware of that workflow. The last place you're going to see a lot of changes is under the My Groups tab. The grouping itself has not changed. It's the reports that we have improved. So I'm gonna click on the Reports tab. And there's so much less clicking going on here. <laughs> um, if you've been with us for a while, you know, getting down into your data was very, very clicky. It was all there. It was just a matter of having to actually like dig down deep into it. So we've come clean that up for you. You still have the ability to view by assignment, by assessment, or under the Star Smart or in Florida. Um, I'm sorry, it's not called Star, Star Smart, it's, but it's basically the same report. Um, it's by standard. So you're actually seeing by student, by standard, how your students are performing. Under assignments, I can click on it either by group or by student. So under group, 
you know, you just click on that. I can see current or past assignments, and I can see everything that has been assigned to this particular group of students. Under quizzes, it would be the same thing either by group or by student, or you can do the quiz progress monitoring. Progress monitoring is where you can see it by standard, and it's like a cumulative report. I'll show you one in just a moment. And then again, on the Star Smart report to so the um, summative testing here, this is the SSA practice test or the STAR practice test. I can see it by group or student. Again, the progress monitoring report is amazing and shows you where the students are at based on each standard, or I can look at individual items on an assessment. What that looks like, Uh, this is the um, a fifth grade version of it. So in Texas, of course, they spiral third, fourth, and fifth onto the star test. So you can see all every time this group has been tested on each of the standards and that cumulative score on how they're doing. And then I can click on the demo or the group name itself, and I can see by student how they're performing on each individual standard. So it's really helpful and again, cumulative. So every time they get tested on it, this is gonna change based on how they are doing on this particular standard. Um, and all of that is located on the platform under progress monitoring report. These are for the summative like STAR or SSA test or by quiz report, quiz monitoring. All right. So those are kind of high level changes to our platform. Um, don't worry, when you receive this um, slide deck and the recording for today, it does have all of the changes that we made. It has that little workflow for how to reassign a quiz. The last thing we want to kind of talk about, FinView has not changed at all. It's still super easy for them. But we do want to give you just a couple of ideas for implementation and ways that you can use EdgeSmart within the classroom. For um, Since we do have the 5e lesson model as, um, as that new feature, the new filter you can use, we want, to, want you to keep in mind the 5e lesson model is not designed to be linear, right? We don't always start with the engage and end with evaluate. You do these pieces, it can go in kind of a circle. We might always start with the engage, but then we move into the explore and we teach a piece of the content and then we explain it. And then we may go back into explore. And throughout the whole process, you're doing the evaluate. Like it, it's ongoing and continuous. Some students may never reach this elaborate piece. Elaborate is where we take what the kids have learned and apply it to new material. Some kids may need a reteach and not an elaborate. So it really depends on where your students are at. But the 5e lesson like model filter is designed to be a support for you, not necessarily a one size fits all, because that doesn't work in science. So we have some example models of how you can use that 5e lesson. Um, when you are doing the explain piece, like we rock on the explain piece. Our instruction module is perfect to have that direct teach component um, where the teacher is really giving the nice wrapped up neat explanation that includes a correct vocabulary. We're really clearing up any misconceptions and summarizing it. But explain also means that the students need to be able to do the explaining, right? It's not just the teacher lecturer component. Students need to talk about it. They need to use the vocabulary and explain the concept using their own words. So our instruction module companion is really great for that because you get the instruction mod, which is the direct teach, and then the students are doing the explaining as well. Great way to use the explain piece. So again, we have a lot of examples for you of where things might fit, but we don't want that to be a limiting factor for you. For example, um, I could use 
of course, the driving question or anchoring phenomenon as an engaged piece. But in some cases with your um, English language learners, you might wanna use the word explorer as your engaged piece, right? And let them start building, pre-building that vocabulary. Interactivities are great for engage. They're playing a game, they're having fun. Um, readers, I love using readers to engage my kids. I would always pair them with a fiction story. So I have fiction and nonfiction and I have engaged my students. Um, Again, some students may never reach this elaborate component. So instead of elaborate, we're doing a reteach. We're doing a student review. There's just lots of ways you can use this 5e lesson cycle. But while we do have kind of a suggested workflow and notice the evaluate is ongoing and continuous, lots of options for how we can use that throughout the lesson cycle. Um, we also have ways of doing the elaborate and the intervention simultaneously. And the best way to do that is stations. All right, so, and yes, I see the question in the um, chat about about the students' data and then like following the students. So um, I'll address that in just one moment. But um, again, this is just kind of to reiterate when and why you might use a live lesson versus an assignment and the difference between them. Again, it's important to remember that when you're doing a live lesson, there's no individual data being collected. So I'm leading the students through the instruction mod. That does not mean that I'm seeing like how long they took on it or collecting any data that way. Um, in stations, and I have this kind of broken up by grade level uh, or by uh, grade group because there's a, a couple of different options at each level, but in, in flow, it really would be the same. We always include a vocabulary station. Uh, whether you use the glossary at the lower grade levels or the word explorer at the upper grade levels, that vocabulary component is so crucial. Station two, we would use some kind of digital literacy activity, whether it be um, student reviews or an interactivity or a simulation. Um, all of those are available at different grade levels. And I'm gonna move on just to third through eighth. Biology has a separate one just because there's little changes to each one. But again, it's vocabulary, digital, digital literacy. Station three would be a traditional literacy, reading and writing. They can do readers. They can do um, journal prompts. You could have them do like partner reading at the lower grade levels um, or maybe some kind of doodle note. I love doing doodle notes in my class. That was always one of my favorites. And then station four, we have as a makerspace. Notice this is the biology version now. Um, as we move into the new TEKS for 2024, it is going to become so crucial that we incorporate the engineering component of each of these standards. Um, engineering is how we solve the problems that science comes up with and investigates and explains. And so that solving the problem component is really crucial. Having students create a model is so powerful when they actually create something with their hands, something in 3D. Um, and they can do amazing things with like really simple supplies. Give them some, some cardboard and some popsicle sticks and some Play-Doh and kids can come up with amazing models. Or in kindergarten, you might say create a toy. They're still creating a model. And it's really a powerful concrete learning tool to help make um, these concepts really concrete for our students. So um, stations work really well. Again, all of this allows you some small group intervention time with your students. So when you've diagnosed where they're struggling, it gives you that, that reteach opportunity. Student reviews are perfect for that, but there's lots of opportunities to reteach within that small group time or to use it to accelerate your students who are ready for that. So with all of that said, we do, of course, uh, we're providing you some other information within the like the slide deck that we're giving you. Um, but overall, those are the biggest changes to our platform. Differentiation options are still there, you know, various Lexile levels on the readers. The simulations still have claim evidence reasoning or the traditional lab data form. Um, student reviews are great for using whole group or small group, or even for individual students, depending on their learning. 
And the IMCs, there's a ton of ways you can differentiate the IMC. That's that note-taking guide to really help support your students. Since it is also the beginning of the year, we just wanna remind you that you are not just getting um, an amazing product with EduSmart, but we're here for you every step of the way with professional development and implementation support. Um, that may look like we can come in during your PLC time for specific district initiatives, or as you get ready here in Texas to implement the new TEKS, or whether there's something that you wanna focus on like using stations or increasing the amount of STEM you do, or um, maybe using more writing or more literacy in your science classroom, we can really create um, a specific PLC lesson time for you. That's a great time because we know teachers are already meeting during their PLCs. So it's a great time to come in and kind of bump up that edge of smart time. So we just wanna make sure everyone is aware that those are options and that we are there for you as you implement. So <gasps> with all that, I think this may be a record for me. That was 37 minutes. It's like edge of smart in 37 minutes. <laughs> I really do think that's a record. I like to talk a lot. Um, I will open it up for questions. We'll stay as long as we need to for questions. We do want to make sure you have my email, leah at edgesmart.com. I'm the Director of Professional Development and All Things Training. So please feel free to reach out and contact us with any technical um, questions, problems, needs, uh, rostering kind of questions that you might have. You can always reach out to support at edgesmart.com. They are amazing at getting back to you like almost instantly. They're so good and so responsive for anything that you might need. So uh, just to give a quick look at the question, I saw a question in the chat about the rostering. So yeah, in the previous years, the quiz scores from third and fourth moved forward. I actually did not know that. So I'm going to find out that for you, Ms. Trammell, and I will get back to you. I'm taking a screenshot of the question. Um, as far as I know, nothing on that has changed. So the way that we're rostering students is still in place. So, and we never lose data. So the data always stays with the students. So I'm assuming that's gonna be the exact same process. If it has changed, I will let you know, but I think that's gonna be um, when you roster the next year, it's gonna appear just like it has in the past. Awesome. I'm so excited to be giving that support. Um, Thank you everyone for, um, again, giving up your afternoon after school. Oh my goodness. I, I just applaud you so much for being here. I remember those first couple of weeks of just being like a haze of exhaustion. So um, I hope this was helpful. Um, we look forward to supporting you throughout the year and it's going to be a great school year. So you know, let's get at it. Good luck to you as you begin and um, looking forward to hearing from you. I see some PD is going to be keeping me busy this summer. So um, that'll be awesome. Or this, the rest of the school year. So I'm looking forward to that. So thank you all so much for being here. We'll stay around for any other questions in just a moment, but otherwise uh, you'll be receiving your PD um, hours and the slide deck in just a day or two. Bye all. Thanks a lot.